Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'm Marquita, and today I'm going to talk about culturally responsive problem solving. So as Amy uh, and Jennifer mentioned, I started this work a while ago with DPI, and the purpose was really to figure out how to make problem solving more effective, how to make outcomes more positive for all students, but especially those students who are most marginalized. So in that work, um, we worked on the development of a webinar, which was in the invite that you all received. So today, I'm going to be presenting a really small part of that larger webinar, as well as some of the other work on developing a guide for problem solving practice. So the part that I'm going to be presenting on today is really one of the most important parts of problem solving. And that is, how do we identify why a problem is occurring? That's what we're gonna focus on. How do we identify why a problem is occurring? We start there because that why helps inform intervention, other supports that inform the entire problem solving process. If we get that why wrong, it is likely that all of the work that we're putting into a problem solving process won't be as effective. So we're gonna start out by first talking generally about culturally responsive problem solving. It sounds like a huge, overwhelming topic that's pretty nebulous and we never really know what we're doing in culturally responsive problem solving because it's not as practical. But today is about practical strategies, things that you can do right now and take back to your schools and actually make a difference with the problem solving process. So generally when we're talking about problem solving, we're talking about our general four stage process that we use. But today we're gonna to focus on the problem identification part. That is where we start to identify why a problem is occurring. Now, we generally can understand that a problem is a discrepancy, right? We have a kid that's performing at some level, we wanna get them to another level. But there are a lot of challenges that come along with figuring out why is that discrepancy there? Why does that discrepancy exist? And some of those challenges for academic, social, emotional, behavioral, mental health problems some of those challenges, one is a lack of knowledge. We might just not understand the problem. We might not understand a lot about mental health. We may not understand a lot about, men, about behavior. We may not understand a lot about social emotional development. So that lack of knowledge can contribute to us having some difficulty with understanding why a problem is occurring. In addition to that, we might just um, not recognize that there's a wide range of variability in terms of what's typical, what's normal, and so that can complicate our process. We have students that are quite different from each other in temperament, style, personality, all of those factors. We have cultural differences, which are differences in beliefs, values, perspectives. But we also have our own subjectivity. We are a part of the problem solving process. When we are working with kids and families, when we're working individually or on teams, we are a part of the process. Our own subjectivity matters in how we think about problems and how we solve problems. That's complicated when you look at our own biases, stereotypes, and prejudices. That further complicates our subjectivity. We already walk into a room knowing that the way I see a problem or whether or not I think something is a problem may differ from person to person. On top of that, we might come in with our own biases, stereotypes, and prejudices. So today we're gonna focus on how do we address this subjectivity in the problem solving process? Because you can do PDs and other things to learn about knowledge, learn about ranges of behavior, so on and so forth, but we need to spend some really devoted time on just understanding the subjectivity in the problem solving process. So that's the core element of culturally responsive problem solving. First of all, it's problem solving for all kids, not just the minority kids. Does that make sense? Culturally responsive problem solving is for every single kid that you see. It is, you should just use this as evidence-based practice. But there is a significant need to make sure that you are using these processes with students who have been marginalized because they are more vulnerable. They are more, subject, they are more likely to experience that subjectivity due to biases, stereotypes, and prejudices. So we have an added reason, an added significance as to why we use culturally responsive problem solving with students who have been marginalized. So this process is essentially helping us recognize, yes, our families are different, yes, we are different, how do we acknowledge that and address that in the problem solving process in a systemic way that we know what we're doing. It is not a process where we're just saying, you know what, everybody's different and I need to learn everything about everybody's whole life forever and then try to boil that down into a problem solving meeting. No, 
we're trying to understand that there are differences, but how do I critically think about those differences to know what's relevant, what's not relevant, in order to inform the problem solving process? So in that, what we're going to focus on um, is recognizing first that problem solving process, the cultural responsive problem solving process, is not one tool, it's not one intervention. We're gonna be talking about how we think. That is what we're talking about, how we think. You already know a lot about interventions. You know a lot about assessment. You know a lot about how to support kids. But today what we're gonna focus on is how do we start to think critically about diversity in a way that it can translate to our selection of interventions, our selection of supports in the process. And secondly to this, in this process is to recognize that the problem doesn't lie within the student, family, or their culture. We're gonna disrupt that thinking. The problem does not lie within the student, family, or culture. You say, okay, how do we do that? Well, that's what we're gonna be talking about. How do we get there? So let's talk about the problem solving process. There are two strategies that we're gonna go over today. These are strategies that you're gonna start using right away. There is no magic here. I just wanna be really clear. There is no magic. You're gonna say, Marquita, really? I can do that? That's what you're gonna, no magic. Two strategies when we're trying to understand why a problem is occurring so that we can then better select supports for students that don't further marginalize them. One of our challenges is that when we enter the room as educators, as helping professionals, we think I would never harm a child. And that is true. I would never make a decision that would marginalize a child. That is true in your belief system. But you could still make decisions that marginalize children. So you need to recognize when could that be happening? When could that be happening when I'm not even aware of it? Does that make sense to everybody? I know that all of you care about kids. That's not even a question. I know you work hard every day. Because I don't want to do what you do. <laughs> I know you work hard every day. Okay, I have a daughter and that's hard. Okay, and that's one of them. Okay, I know you work hard. This is about how can we be better? How can we do what we do better? Because I don't walk into the school saying, how can I mistreat kids who live in poverty? I don't walk into the building and say, how can I make black kids feel unwelcomed in this space? But you might do that. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's what we want to try to be in charge of for ourselves. That's what we want to hold ourselves accountable to. So in problem solving, we're going to talk about these two strategies. As I said, this is a part of the larger webinar. So there's going to be much more detail in the webinar, but I'm going to give you two things to start with for today. One is, how do we reframe deficit-based thinking, deficit-based conceptualizations of a problem? So you may have heard about deficit-based thinking, but today we're going to talk about, okay, we know what it is, what do we do about it? Right? That's the first thing. The second thing is, how do you then identify an actual hypothesis about why the problem is occurring that will be helpful, that will actually help us to get to interventions that actually work and are appropriate for kids? So let's start with the deficit-based thinking. So generally, when you hear about deficit-based thinking, we're talking about beliefs that we hold about factors that are causing a problem that blame the child. Oh, this kid lives in poverty, that's why they can't read. Oh, this kid is lazy. Oh, the parents don't care. That's deficit-based thinking. Anytime you are blaming some aspect of who a person is for their academic or behavioral performance, that's deficit-based thinking. Well, you say, well, you know what, there are problems. Like, isn't that a deficit? If you say this kid does not have the reading fluency skills to comprehend on grade level, that's a problem. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's not saying anything about something is wrong with that child. Right? This kid does not have the math computation skills to perform on grade level. That's a problem. This kid does not have the social skills to develop relationships with the kids in their classroom. That's a problem. Do you understand? That's not deficit-based thinking. Deficit-based thinking is when you are blaming a person for the very fact of who they are as to why they are not performing on grade level or having behavioral, social, emotional, mental health difficulties. We're good? That's the difference. So now you say, okay, we have that. We have this deficit-based thinking. I may have heard some people blame poverty. What do I do with that, Marquita? We're gonna reframe that gonna change that way of thinking. That is what reframing is. 
So this is your first strategy. How do we start to change this way of thinking? So in my building, in my district, if I hear a person say, this kid lives in poverty, that's why they can't read, no. We don't let that fly. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is not true. So that's what we're talking about. So there are three broad categories of how these deficit-based conceptualizations come forward. And we call those attributions. Attributions are basically factors that we say are causing a problem. These are the factors that we say are causing a problem. Three broad categories of factors that are deficit-based. Unfounded attributions. These are attributions for which there's just no evidence. Factors that there's just no evidence to prove that is true. So this is when you're having people say, well, you know, the parent doesn't really care about the kid's education. And everybody's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How do we know that? How do we know that? Are we all just going to buy into the stereotype? Is that what we're going to do as a team? Do you understand what I'm saying? Where's your evidence? Oh, they missed the meeting. Mm-mm. That's not evidence. I would hate for people to say, I missed my child's meeting. That means that I don't care about their education. Have you spoken to the parent and they told you that they don't care about their child's education? Nope, don't have that. OK. You know what we say? No evidence for that. Can't use that in a decision-making process. Does that make sense to everybody? These are the factors that we have no evidence to suggest that they are true. This is oftentimes when people are operating on stereotypes and biases. And then we just go along with it and let it fly. You have to interrupt that thinking. You have to disrupt that thinking. So those are the categories unfounded. Untrue means that it's just not true. This is where we see the identity link. Anytime we're trying to link a person's identity as the factor that is causing academic or behavioral mental health difficulties, that's not true. We have no evidence that your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, none of that causes academic or behavior problems. Not one lick of evidence. But we'll sit back and say, because this student lives in poverty, because this student is black, no. Now, you might say, well, you know what? We do have underperformance among our black students. We do have underperformance among our students who live in poverty. OK, so then what is the relationship there? A person can experience stress due to the experience of being members of these groups. So a kid living in poverty can experience poverty-related stress, and that is associated with academic and behavioral difficulties. It is not that it is something wrong with the child. This is how the world is treating them for who they are, and that causes stress. So when you have mistreatment of a student based on their race, so discrimination, mistreatment or stress due to living in poverty, that's poverty-related stress. Anytime a person is mistreated for who they are, that stress factor is what is associated with academic and behavioral outcomes. But that doesn't mean that I'm saying something is wrong with this child for living in poverty or for being black or for being lesbian. That's not the problem. The identity is not the problem. It is never a problem. There is nothing wrong with who you are as a person. That's just right. But somebody might be mistreating you because of who you are. You might feel marginalized in your school setting, and you know that those teachers don't care about you. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is the experience in the world of how you are treated because of your identity that can cause the stress. And that stress is what is associated, not causal, what is associated with academic and behavioral difficulties. I just want you to sit with that for a second. Anytime we're trying to make that causal link, we have to get out of that. If I'm worried that a student is being mistreated for who they are, then I need to address the mistreatment. That's the intervention. I'm not just saying, oh, this is your situation. We can't do anything about it. 
Those are untrue. So in this area here, you have to really be ready to break those, that uninformed piece that could be fueling why people are linking identity with actual academic or behavioral difficulties. It, is not, it does not exist. And then we have the unalterable. These are things that we cannot change. There are things that we cannot change. The parents might be incarcerated. They might be living in poverty. We can't change those things. It's okay to acknowledge that these are factors we cannot change. But anytime you have factors that are impacting a student that you cannot change, you're trying to help them cope. How to deal, how to manage. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean that my hands are done, my, my hands are clean on this. I don't have to do anything. I can't change anything about that. No, how do I help a student manage, cope, and still be successful in face of having some challenges that we don't change, that we cannot change? That's what we're talking about with unalterable. So anytime we have the, any factors that are falling into one or more of these categories, that's when we need to actually reframe it. We need to change that thinking, disrupt that thinking, and not just let it fly by. Because it informs how people solve problems. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So I just want you to take a second and just think about what attributions have you made and which ones have you made, had, may have heard on a team or just in a building. I just want you to think about that. What factors do we point to when we're saying this kid isn't reading on grade level, this kid is struggling with their behavior, this kid is struggling social emotionally? When we're pointing to these untrue, unfounded, unalterable factors, they absolve us of our responsibility to do something. They absolve us of our responsibility to do something. They matter. So I want you to just reflect on that on a second, and then in Q&A, we're going to talk a little bit more about it. So why is that important? Why am I saying you have to address these things? A lot of times, they just fly by. Why am I saying you have to address these factors, these untrue, unalterable, unfounded factors? Because when people think that something is out of their control, they will not attempt to change it. Do you understand what I'm saying? If this kid is having trouble reading because they live in poverty, I can't do anything about that. That's my belief as to why the problem is happening. That's why we have to interrupt that thinking. It's out of my hands. Not, not to mention the fact that it might not even be true. It's untrue and it's out of my hands. I'm done. That's why we interrupt this thinking. It matters for how people engage in the problem-solving process. I change what I'm in control of. So every time we hear these attributions, we want to reframe them. So how do we do that? When we have unfounded attributions, right, these are the ones for which we have no evidence. So you can just simply say, excuse me, Ms. Johnson, we have no evidence to support that that is true. So we cannot consider that in this process. We're done. Are you being mean and nasty? I know you can probably be mean and nasty, but you don't have to be mean and nasty. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's just a statement of fact. We can't go on your assumptions, your feelings, a uh, 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 random, I don't know, just intuition. That's not evidence. That's not evidence. So anytime someone is offering up information based on stereotypes, bias, not knowing, unfounded information, my question is, where's your evidence? And if you don't have any, we're moving on. Can we get behind that? We can get behind that. Just say, we don't know that to be true. We are database decision makers. Why are we operating on information that's not data-driven? If you need to go get the evidence, let's go get it. Let's go, is it a question for us? Let's go and find the evidence if that's true. But if you don't have any evidence, we're not operating on that as a part of this process. 
That's how you would address unfounded attribution. What about the untrue one? This is where we got to be ready with our homework here. Like I said, there is no data that is linking who a person is with their, as causal to their academic and behavioral outcomes. No, Ms. Johnson, black kids are not more prone to behavior problems. Do you want me to get you more research on that? It's not true. Do you understand what I'm saying? These kids are just a little bit more violent. That's not true. Now, you want to understand why the problem is occurring. It's not to say that they are not misbehaving. You will never hear me in a room say, oh, we don't have misbehavior in schools. Uh, yeah, we do. <laughs> we have kids that are struggling. Yes, we do. But why? It's not because of who they are. We'll have kids in schools that have barely enough resources, and we're expecting them to perform on the same level as kids with all the resources. Why do we expect that? We, we do, though. We do. We do, right? And if they don't, then what? Something is wrong with them. I don't get that. Why are we blaming children? Do you understand what I'm saying? So this you need to be ready with your homework. No, we have no data that says because a kid born in poverty cannot read. If that's the case, I wouldn't be standing up here because I wouldn't be able to read. You know many people who grow up in poverty and they know how to read. Why are we playing that game? Oh, you know what, I might be a little bit uncomfortable, Dr. Newell, I don't know. I don't think I can say that to my colleague. Why are you an educator? You're there for the children. Don't take a space that you cannot hold. Do you understand? Don't do that. Don't do that. I would rather let people believe something is wrong with this child because I don't want to tell you that you need better classroom management. How is that? And like I said, you're not being mean and nasty. None of this is mean and nasty. It's what do we need to do that's right by children. 